Lions are the only social cats in the world. All others are solitary. The cubs not only have their mothers to look after them, but often attentive aunts as well. Within the pride, there are always companions to play with. A lion has a great deal to learn, including how to kill. First attempts often end in failure. Then there are questions of precedence. An adult male receives a lesson from a more powerful companion. Seniority acknowledged, he's allowed to share the kill. There are about 500 lions in Etosha National Park, Namibia. This is an account of how they live together and of the family affairs of one pride in particular as their cubs struggle to grow up. Until recently, Namibia was known as Southwest Africa. It's a huge country lying between Angola and the Republic of South Africa. Namibia's Etosha National Park is almost the size of Wales. It centers round a 75 mile long, occasionally flooded lake bed called the Etosha Pan. The Ombika Pride, named after one of Etosha's waterholes, is dominated by two immense males, each weighing 550 pounds. One is gold maned, the other black. So long as they're present, no other males dare to muscle in on Ombika preserves. In the early morning, the pride moves down to the waterhole. The zebra spot their sagging bellies and recognize that they've just fed, so they're not afraid. They know the lions just want an early morning drink after their feast. You could call Ombika this pride's own waterhole, but they're not necessarily in charge here. With six resident lionesses and frequent young additions, pride strength varies all the time. At the moment, they number 19. The protection of two big males, plus a year-round supply of game in the area, makes the pride an extremely stable one. With so much prey available, hunting failures aren't so important. To protect both its hunting preserve and its females, the pride's territory must be constantly staked out by scent marking, usually high up on bushes. The males range for miles, often at night, renewing scent marks as a keep-off warning to other lions. Scraping is a way of making sure the scent lasts for as long as possible. From time to time, scent marking is reinforced by roaring, which can be heard for miles. The resident lion samples scent left by an intruder. He cancels it out by leaving his own mark. He's plainly uneasy, so maybe there are rival lions in the area. There they are, two very strong intruding males.
These two lions are two miles inside the resident pride's territory. Maybe they're about to make a takeover bid for the pride. For some reason, they appear extremely confident. The resident male continues to trot away in front of them. But at last, the intruder's confidence evaporates. The rightful owner turns, reinforced by a companion. The advance becomes a retreat. It's typical of the way lions conduct their affairs. They're far too powerful to risk outright conflict territorial disputes are usually settled peaceably. The victors relax, knowing they're secure behind their invisibly marked frontiers for the moment. The females scent Mark too. When a lioness is in season, this has a powerful message for the males. The wrinkled grimace is typical of a lion detecting another lion's scent, in this case a female who is ready to mate. The grimace is sometimes a prelude to an advance or a rebuff. Mm -hmm. But it's the lionesses that often take the initiative. The eternal triangle is a frequent occurrence. In this one, there are two males. Mating fights are one of the few times when rival males inflict quite severe wounds on each other. When the fight is over, the female makes the first pass. Back the victor goes to make sure his rival has got the message. The lioness hasn't been won without some slight facial rearrangement to her suitor. The cubs are born after a gestation period of between 105 and 112 days. They can be any number from one to seven in a litter. Just like domestic kittens, they're born blind. They're weaned at around six or seven months. These ones are about six weeks old. There's no telling who their father is. In this pride, it could be either black mane or goldie. Cubs in the same litter can have different fathers. Both big males probably mated with the same lioness.
Being born into a stable pride like this one has tremendous advantages for the cubs. Big Pride is an effective hunting group, so the cubs seldom go hungry and the nursing mothers have plenty of milk. With six resident lionesses, there's usually a good number of young companions for the cubs to play with. These three all belong to the same mother. Lionesses are extremely firm with their cubs, but they're also very tender. Another advantage of the pride system is that cubs of all ages, belonging to different mothers, play together. So the smallest cubs learn the rough and tumble of life at an early age and grow up increasingly able to take care of themselves. It's useful to have a lot of ants around, too. Cubs know that they can appeal to almost any of the lionesses for affection, and sometimes even for milk, if there's another nursing mother in the pride. If they're not welcome, they're politely told to go away. The cub finally returns to her own mother, or perhaps to a friendly aunt who is also nursing young. It's sometimes hard to tell. When calling up stray cubs, females usually give a series of low grunts. Here she's roaring. The effect is the same. The cub comes scampering out of hiding to join its mother. The advantage of having sisters or half-sisters willing to take care of each other's cubs really comes into its own when a mother is seriously injured as a result of hunting. Some of these cubs don't belong to this lioness, yet she's leading them down to drink. Their real mother lies at the bottom of this small water hole, mortally injured. Her jaws are smashed, probably by the hooves of a zebra she was trying to bring down. She'll no longer be able to feed herself or her cubs. But the pride system gives them a very good chance of being fed and reared by another lioness. Despite the support given them by the pride, small cubs are quite vulnerable. Hyenas are a constant menace. 
All lions dislike hyenas and none more than a temporarily isolated female with cubs. These hyenas are sizing the cubs up. The lioness knows it and moves closer. Even so, the hyenas might still have tried to steal a cub had they not spotted some vultures landing a little distance away. They realized there were easier pickings elsewhere. It's not unknown for adult males to ill-treat and even kill cubs, particularly when males have just moved into a pride. But the situation inside the Ombika pride is secure, and Blackmane and Goldie are quite tolerant. First, Goldie's tail. Next, it's the turn of Black Mane's Black Mane. Perhaps the most difficult thing when making a film about lions is that they spend over 20 hours out of every 24 just resting and sleeping. The four hours of activity usually occur around dawn and dusk. With the Ombika pride, dawn is the time for hunting. Dusk is often when the pride moves down to the waterhole for its evening drink. This pride, unlike many others, never kills here. Nevertheless, the giraffes prefer to keep them well within view. The giraffes have got young with them and they're taking no chances. As the sun goes down, only the big and powerful who have nothing to fear are left at the waterhole. King of Beasts backs down when an elephant wants his drinking place. The cubs recognize no such system of rank. All they know is that it's cool, and the cool of the evening is a fine time to play. These zebra are taking a chance by drinking so late. A large pride often gets scattered over a wide area. 
Dusk is the time for letting any missing members know that everyone else has gathered beside the waterhole. On moonless nights, lion activity sometimes ceases after sundown. But on the night of the full moon, there'll be plenty of action beside the water hole at Ombika. A full moon rises over the water hole where the 19 strong Ombika pride of lions is spending the night. Even in bright moonlight, it would be impossible for an observer to see exactly what happens to the pride during the hours of darkness. But the camera is equipped with an image intensifier. This seizes upon and brightens the merest glimmer of light. The arrival of some elephants makes a lioness uneasy for her cubs. She calls them to her. Just as in daylight, it's the lions who move out of the elephant's way. As so often, it's the young elephants who throw their weight about as if trying their strength. Some more adults with young arrive. Etosha is one of the very few places left in Africa where black rhinos live. During the daytime, they're secretive and seldom seen. At night, they come to drink. They're not too keen on sharing the water hole with lions either. Even a big male like black mane begins to feel uncomfortable. A threat from a quite young rhino and he's off. An uneasy truce follows, both sides keeping their distance. It's highly unlikely that anything serious will develop between the rival groups, although both rhinos and lions do have young with them. After a time, it's the lion cubs who turn the encounter into a game. A cub plays grandmother's footsteps with a one-ton youngster. Now a rather larger rhino moves in to support the youngster, but the cubs aren't impressed.
eventually, when three rhinos get together, the lions decide the game is over. They retire to do what they've really been meaning to do all the time, sleep the rest of the night away. They won't stir now until dawn and it's time to go hunting. The Ombiko pride is consistent in its hunting habits. It never kills at its own waterhole and it prefers to go after its prey around dawn. Zebra are the main quarry. This morning, the two big males, Goldie and Black Mane, join the pride as it fans out in open order through the Mopani scrub. The big zebra herds are wary. Single animals are more easily surprised in the thick cover. The pride is in no hurry. A steady walk is all that's required until the victim is singled out. The scattered formation will add to the quarry's confusion. The victim is a youngster, not so quick in its getaway as its more experienced companions. The very small cubs aren't able to keep up with the hunt. They'd be a handicap anyway. So their mother has left them hidden in the grass. Now she walks back two miles to collect them and lead them to the kill. In many prides, very small cubs arriving late on a kill would have to go without or even get driven off. The Ombika prides territory is usually so well stocked with game that there's seldom a food shortage. So the lioness is quite happy to leave her infants to fend for themselves. But this one will have to be quick. The kill is fast disappearing. At last, it finds a way in and gets its share. Small cubs have a lot to learn, and one important lesson is not to be a hindrance in a hunting situation. A kudu bull approaches, unaware of an ambush.
Not knowing that their mother is lining up their next meal, the cubs continue to play. The kudu is alert, but not yet scared. He wants to get to the water. A call of alarm. Something's given the game away. And here it is. A third cub comes strolling in at the crucial moment. The mother resigns herself to failure. Though very young cubs are tolerated by all Pride members, the mothers often get fed up and have to discipline their children. They gently grip and cuff them. She wants to pick it up, but the cub won't cooperate. When they get bigger, the cubs sometimes turn the tables on their parents. This probably also serves as a lesson in how to trip up prey. The large cub on the ground is about to receive an unusually severe reprimand. A second lioness, with youngster in tow, arrives to assist with the disciplinary action. There's no way of knowing what the young lion has done to deserve such a telling off. If they're to survive, cubs have to find out what's good, or at least possible, to eat. First, the mother inspects this exceptionally well-armored meal. Then she retires to watch the cubs try to find an answer to the problem.
The cubs can undoubtedly smell meat inside the shell. They don't yet understand that claws and teeth aren't very good for extracting it. A pied crow has spotted the situation. They're great opportunists. Though this tortoise won't provide a meal, lions do eat a surprising variety of things, including carrion, small mammals such as rabbits and hares, and even, occasionally, fruit. The lion cub gives up. But not the crow. Crows never give up, not so long as there's the slimmest chance of a meal. But tortoises have evolved their defences over many millions of years. They know that all they have to do is to wait until lions or crows get fed up and go away. But there are some apparently impregnable animal defence systems which lions can penetrate. Some lions specialise in killing and eating porcupines. In the neighbouring Kalahari Desert, porcupines are high on the list of their prey. This particular Etosha lion also seems to be a porcupine expert. Extracting the quills and even crunching them up calls for a special technique. The quills are as sharp as needles. Many a lion has been left with a bad septic wound as the result of getting a quill deeply embedded in its mouth or paw. The attraction of a porcupine as prey is probably that it's slow and easy to catch. An adult can weigh 40 pounds, so there's a worthwhile amount of meat on it for a single lion. When it comes to hunting larger prey, camouflage plays a big part. If you've ever wondered why lions are golden yellow, these scenes provide the answer. The colour of a lion might be described as the colour of Africa. You'd never know they were there unless you walked right into one. This, of course, is what they're hoping that animals like these zebra will do. In tall yellow grass, the zebra's best defence is to move in line astern. It's in more open country that hunting at pride strength really pays. Some of the pride waits in full view. The zebra knows perfectly well that they're there. It also knows that the lions will never make it across the open ground in time to kill. A prudent withdrawal seems the best policy. It's the other lions, the ones that the zebra can't see, which are the ones to worry about. Another party approaches, with them a single wildebeest. Tossing of the head is often a sign of nervousness when they suspect lions are around. The trap is about to be sprung. This time the zebra are too wary.
but the lone wildebeest looks a better proposition. It's amazing how many failures lions have, even when hunting as a pride. The ambush is laid beside a waterhole at the edge of the Atosha pan. A steady stream of animals can be expected as they come to drink. This time the target is well within range and nicely bunched. A lioness coming from the other direction made the kill in the cloud of dust. The victim, once again, is a yearling zebra, not so fleet-footed or experienced as the rest. The whole pride of ten lions converges to claim its share. Five minutes after the kill, there is only a stain on the ground to show where the zebra had been. After the feast, a drink. Anyone who owns a cat knows how it uses the rough upper surface of its tongue to lap up milk. A lion drinks in exactly the same way. It often drinks about a gallon at a time and takes as much as 10 minutes to lap it all up. In slow motion, you can see the upper surface of the tongue at work. With their robust sense of play, young males soon become a nuisance to the pride and are forced out. They then become, at least for a time, lone hunters. To learn his trade, this outcast established himself by a waterhole outside his former pride's territory. Among Itosha lions, he proved a complete exception. His behavior remained consistent every day during the three weeks Des and Jen Bartlett stayed with him to film his first attempts at making a kill. For three weeks, he was dramatically unsuccessful. Here is a record of some of his more spectacular failures. It wasn't that he lacked targets. He loses them in the dust. Mm -hmm. 
Not a hope. He left himself too much ground to cover. That time he didn't pick his target early enough. Charging in the midday sun is thirsty work, especially when you miss. A knockdown at last to the zebra. Now he's learning. He switches targets. It is hard to understand how this young lion survived for three weeks until he made his first kill. But he was almost certainly scavenging at night off carcasses. He was also hunting small mammals. His instinctive reaction is to drag his kill away where it will be safe from scavengers and even rival lions. He's had plenty of time to choose a spot. It's an isolated bush which he believes will be safe. His caution is fully justified. These two lionesses have come for a drink and will soon smell the kill. Inside the bush, the successful hunter is unaware of any threat. The young male has finally grown up. He can not only kill, he can also defend his spoils. This is only a fraction of Vitosha's lions. There are at least 500 of them in Namibia's vast national park. Their future should be secure. But as Namibia approaches independence, conditions are bound to be uncertain. Etosha lies only 75 miles from the Angola border, and there is always the chance that guerrilla warfare will erupt in this part of Africa. As so often, the future of the lions, as well as that of all the other animals of Etosha, depends on the territorial ambitions of the human species. <laughs>